Have you ever wondered what life is like for the Inuits? What secrets lie with their hidden lifestyle? Join me as we dive into the tribe known for their strong family values, relaxed social structure, and a strong belief in the supernatural. They're anything but ordinary with customs and traditions that might seem a bit questionable. For instance, Inuit culture embraces a form of shamanism deeply rooted in animist principles. They believe all entities possess a spirit, extending to humans and even inanimate objects. They also believe in a number of supernatural entities that hold sway over these spirits, suggesting that appeasing these beings can influence the behavior of animals or objects as needed. But this is nothing compared to the other things we will reveal in a few minutes. After watching this video, you will come to realize that your perception of the Inuit is greatly different from what they truly are. Around 5,000 years ago, groups of people settled on both sides of the Bering Strait, which at that time was ice-free. The area was a magnet for hunters from different backgrounds due to its abundant wildlife on land and in the sea. It's in this region that the earliest evidence of the ancestors of the Eskimos was found. The term Eskimo, derived from the Algonquin language meaning eater of raw meat, was first used by French settlers in the 17th century and is considered a racial slur by the Inuit. Nowadays, they prefer to be referred to by their local names like Yupik or the broader term Inuit, which means the people. For centuries, the Inuit communities of the Arctic North have relied on their natural surroundings, strong leadership, and innovative skills to navigate the challenging environments they call home. During the long winter months, certain Anuit communities construct temporary shelters known as igloos from compacted snow. Also, when temperatures rose above freezing during the brief summer season, they lived in tents created from animal skins supported by bone or wooden frames. The Inuit sustained themselves mainly through fishing and hunting sea mammals like seals, whales, walruses, and caribou. Their resourcefulness and artistic ability were evident in their use of all parts of the animals for food, clothing, and tools. Crafting innovative implements such as spears and harpoons, parka coats, blankets, and boats. They also made art, like small sculptures, from ivory, bone, and soft stone. Their clothes, like the anorak and amauti, were made from animal skins stitched together with bone needles and sinew threads. The amauti also had a big back part to carry babies and protect them from the cold wind. Dogs played essential roles in Inuit life year-round, serving as pack animals in summer and pulling sleds in winter. They assisted with hunting by detecting seals' breathing holes and deterring polar bears. Additionally, they provided protection by alerting the Inuit to the presence of bears or strangers. Inuit preferred visually striking and healthy dogs, such as those with bright eyes and thick coats. Common husky breeds used included the Canadian Eskimo dog, the Greenland dog, the Siberian husky, and the Alaskan Malamute, with the Canadian Eskimo dog being the official animal of Nunavut. It is clear that the Inuit have a deep connection to their environment, and this has forged values of inclusiveness, collaboration, and decision-making within their communities. In an act of cultural resistance and assertion of identity, the Inuit have reclaimed naming practices, choosing names in their own language to affirm their heritage and connection to the land. The renaming of the region to Nunavut, meaning our land in Inuktitut, shows a profound sense of belonging and stewardship over their ancestral territory. Nunavut, the largest and northernmost territory in Canada, has a complex history shaped by encounters with European traders, fishermen, and whalers. While these interactions brought economic opportunities through the fur trade, they also disrupted traditional ways of life and made them dependent on external resources and services. The transition to permanent settlements forced on them by the government further challenged traditional practices leading to a loss of self-sufficiency and increased reliance on external support. Today, the majority of Canada's approximately 60,000 Inuit reside in small, geographically isolated communities, facing significant transportation and communication barriers. Despite challenges, the Inuit maintain a strong presence in Canada and regions like Alaska, Greenland, and parts of Russia, where they continue to uphold their cultural heritage amidst changing landscapes and modern pressures. In Inuit communities, living together in family groups, usually comprising a few families who supported each other, was the norm. This meant that throughout Inuk's life, 
they might only interact with a few hundred people, mainly those within their close-knit network. Survival in such a harsh environment depended heavily on the size and strength of these support networks. The typical Inuit family unit consisted of a couple, their unmarried children, and sometimes the widowed mother or sister of one of the spouses. The eldest male capable of work often served as the spokesperson for the family. Beyond the individual family, there were larger groupings of several families forming hunting parties. Decisions within these groups were made collectively. Depending on the availability of prey, these hunting groups could vary in size, with smaller units forming during times of scarcity. Gender roles in traditional Inuit society were significant but not rigid. Men typically engaged in hunting and fishing, while women took care of domestic tasks such as childcare, housekeeping, sewing, food processing, and cooking. However, exceptions existed, with women occasionally hunting and men expected to know household tasks due to their extended absences during hunting trips. Now, when it comes to marriage, the customs among the Inuit are diverse. Monogamy was not strictly adhered to, with open marriages, polygamy, divorce, and remarriage all observed. In some cases, divorce required community approval, especially if there were children involved. Marriages were sometimes arranged, even in infancy, or enforced by community elders. Marriage often occurred at puberty for women, and when men became proficient hunters, family structures were adaptable, ranging from nuclear families to extended households with multiple generations and adopted children. Each household had a leader, usually an elder or a highly respected individual. Child rearing holds a central place in Inuit culture, where children are cherished above all else. In Inuit tradition, a special ritual marked the arrival of a newborn. After birth, a shaman, known as an angakuk, would place a small ivory whale carving into the baby's mouth, symbolizing the hope for the child to become skilled in hunting. Their development is guided by their interests and abilities, with women playing a major role in passing down ancestral knowledge and traditions. In the past, Inuit mothers displayed remarkable strength, often continuing their activities shortly after childbirth due to their deep understanding of medicinal practices and the need for survival. Traditional parenting was built on kindness and patience, and physical discipline was considered unacceptable. Instead, learning through experimentation and imitation was encouraged, with knowledge primarily transmitted orally. In this manner, the ancient tradition of face tattooing known as Kakiniet or Tuniet in Inuktitut, was passed down and has been practiced by Inuit women for nearly 4,000 years. These tattoos were complex designs that symbolize various aspects of women's lives, including their origins, family connections, achievements, and social status. With the arrival of Catholic missionaries in the early 20th century, the practice of face tattooing was banned. However, in recent years, some modern Inuit women have sought to revive this tradition as a way to honor their ancestors and reconnect with their cultural heritage. Traditionally, the tattoos were applied using needles made from sinew or bone, soaked in suet and sewn into the skin. Today, modern techniques involve the use of ink. The Inuit Tattoo Revitalization Project is a community initiative aimed at promoting the resurgence of this ancient art form celebrating its cultural significance and preserving it for future generations. In many Inuit cultures, oral traditions also recount raids by other indigenous groups, including fellow Inuit, and vengeful actions such as the Bloody Falls Massacre. While some Western observers viewed these stories as exaggerated myths, evidence suggests that Inuit societies effectively passed down accurate historical accounts to younger generations. Historically, Ethnic conflicts between the Dene and Inuit in northern Canada were documented by Samuel Hearn in 1771. In 1996, representatives from both groups participated in a reconciliation ceremony to address long-standing grievances. These historical records highlight a pattern of hostile interactions within Inuit communities and with outsiders. They also demonstrate the existence of Inuit nations and confederations often formed for defense against more powerful enemies. Geographic factors influence the level of aggression, with less fertile regions generally fostering less warlike behavior due to the focus on farming activities. While it may seem that the Inuit are brutal people, generosity and kindness are actually highly valued virtues in Inuit society. 
as cooperation among community members is essential for survival. Expressions of anger were frowned upon, as they could jeopardize the bond of the community. Social pressure played a significant role in education, with displays of bad temper ridiculed, and withholding affection being a severe punishment. The justice system in Inuit communities is far different from what you are familiar with. Justice is overseen by elders who hold significant authority. Similar to many cultures worldwide, punishments could be severe, including capital punishment for serious offenses against individuals or the community. During conflicts with other groups, whether Inuit or not, the approach could be very harsh. Before the Canadian legal system was introduced, customary law was considered non-existent among the Inuit. However, there were clear guidelines, known as Malagait, Pikjet, and Tirigususiet, that governed behavior. If someone violated these guidelines, the shaman, known as the Angakuk, might intervene to prevent dire consequences for the individual or the community. Angakuit were not trained, but were recognized by the community for their spiritual abilities. Living in the Arctic environment inspired rich mythology among the Inuit, filled with tales of adventure and encounters with the supernatural. The long winter months led to stories of ghosts and fantastic creatures, while the Aurora Borealis held mystical significance, believed by some to be the spirits of departed loved ones, or guides for hunting. The central god in Inuit spirituality was the old woman, Sedna, who resided beneath the sea. Inuit believed that all living beings were connected, recognizing the importance of showing respect to spirits and supernatural forces. Failure to do so could result in dire consequences in an environment already fraught with challenges. They completely understood the necessity of working in harmony with the supernatural to ensure their survival and meet the daily demands of life in the Arctic. However, the Inuit community of the modern day has long strayed from the traditions that once molded them the lives of the Inuit people went through significant changes due to colonial influences beyond their control. They transitioned from their traditional land-based economy and close-knit social structures to permanent settlements. The children were forcibly sent to residential or day schools, where some Catholic residential schools were dominated by sexual abuse. These institutions aimed to brainwash the children with the belief that their parents and grandparents were inferior role models. The traditional roles of men, once providers as hunters, underwent significant changes. Many men worked for the government in menial jobs, like garbage collection. The measure of prestige shifted from hunting prowess to income, leading to the emergence of a class system. The Inuit community became divided between those living in settlements and those who maintained a traditional lifestyle on the land. The introduction of a wage economy and a scarcity of job opportunities led to widespread poverty. The transition to settlement life resulted in disorganization rather than reorganization, disrupting established networks of cooperation and weakening communication and values. Inuit harbored fear and distrust toward the Kalunat, or white men, particularly hating the forceful presence of white authority figures in their communities. The slaughter of sled dogs also broke the Inuit's ties to the land and their traditional way of life. This drastic lifestyle change caused instability among the Inuit, particularly the younger generation, leading to heightened levels of frustration and depression. Just like that, social problems such as alcoholism, suicide, violence and delinquency emerged, presenting challenges previously unknown to their communities. Gender-based violence, especially against Inuit women, reached alarming levels. In Nunavut, the rate of violent crimes against women was over 13 times higher than the national average in Canada, with the risk of sexual assault 12 times greater than the average across provinces and territories. In 2016, Nunavut recorded the highest rate of female victims of police-reported family violence in Canada, followed by the Northwest Territories and Yukon. Also, according to the Canadian Centre on Substance Abuse, Inuit communities face some of the highest suicide rates in Canada, ranging from 5 to 25 times higher than the national average. In 2017, 5.8% of Inuit individuals aged 18 and above reported experiencing suicidal thoughts within the past year, with 2.1% reporting attempted suicide. Plus, 13% of Inuit individuals aged 15 and above reported having a mental health condition in 2017 including anxiety, depression, bipolar disorder, 
substance use disorder, or anorexia. Heavy episodic drinking is linked to an increased risk of suicide, with nearly one-third of Inuit individuals aged 15 and above in northern Canada reporting heavy episodic drinking at least once a month in 2017. However, the issue with most of these studies on Inuit mental health focus on substance abuse and suicide is that they overlook other risk factors influenced by colonial impacts. The disruption caused by colonization has strained relationships within Inuit families, leaving many youths feeling isolated, unloved, and resentful towards their parents and partners. The lack of healthy cultural models for love and sexuality makes these issues even worse, with problems in romantic and parent-child relationships contributing to the high suicide rates among Inuit youth. While we paint the picture of the Inuit as a special people known for their nomadic nature and strong adaptation to the Arctic cold, we must also acknowledge these challenges that currently plague them, particularly in regions like Nunavut, where the impact is strongly felt. But what do you think? Can the Inuit community find their way back? Share your thoughts with us in the comment section, and don't forget to subscribe to our channel for more insights into different cultures.